Hello and welcome back. So today we're going to talk about a new lab technique that we're going to be using quite a bit in Go Figure in lab. So before I get started, why don't you guys go ahead and read about how a spectrophotometer works and we'll get talking on this. So the basic idea, if you guys read through all this, is you have a sample inside of a, something called a cuvette right here. You shine light through it and you basically measure how much light makes it through the cuvette. So a simple way of understanding this is the more, basically the more concentration, the more stuff inside the cuvette, the more light will be absorbed. Now keep in mind, obviously, that certain types of light are going to be absorbed and others won't, which is what all this other stuff is for. But basically the bottom line is a spectrophotometer allows you to choose certain types of light, certain frequencies and wavelengths, shine them through a sample contained in a vial known as a cuvette, and then measure how much light went in relative to how much light came out. And the difference between those things is called the absorbance. So it's a way of measuring concentration. So this is called Beer's Law. Beer's Law gives you the relationship mathematically between absorbance and concentration. Now there's some stuff that also matters here. So absorbance, we've already kind of talked about in the introduction here. Now, molar absorptivity. This is going to be different for every substance. It's also going to be different at specific wavelengths. So something to be aware of is, for example, like uh, copper 2 sulfates, a blue solution. At certain wavelengths, especially those in the red and orange, you're going to get a lot of absorption. It's a function of concentration. So E, it kind of looks like epsilon here, it's a constant, or it's a constant for a given wavelength but nothing else. So I'll show you how to calculate this, but for now I'll just kind of shelve that idea. Okay, B is called the path length. It's how far light has to go. So to give you an idea, this right here, this is B. And yes, that should be a straight line in case you're wondering. Okay, it's usually one centimeter. All R cuvettes are gonna be one centimeter. So B is really quite simple. It's just one. <laughs> and then C is concentration. So essentially, how much light's being absorbed depends on how much would be absorbed times how far the light has to go times how much concentration there is. Epsilon and C here work together along with the path length to tell you how much light's going to be absorbed. So let's play around with this a little bit. At a given frequency, what should happen as the concentration increases? So we're talking about absorbance. I want you to take your best guess. So as concentration increases, absorbance should do what? Well, if there's more stuff in the cuvette, we assume that there'll be more absorbance. And then the opposite would also be true. If concentration goes down, we expect absorbance to also go down. This equation describes a direct relationship between A and C, because E and B, epsilon and B, are both constants. So this is just going to work out to be some number. If C goes up, so does A. Okay. Now you can solve for the molar extinction coefficient. It's useful to be able to do this because you may be measuring multiple samples. And since you're not going to want to have to recalculate E every time, and since you know E is going to be a constant, you might as well find it once and get it over with. But again, once you find it, it's good as long as you stay at that wavelength. So, rearrange the equation to solve for epsilon. And remember, this is the equation right here. Take a shot at this. Well, the first thing I do is I'd move the B and the C. They were both on top over here, so they'll end up on the bottom over here. So in the end, you end up with the molar extinction coefficient, epsilon, equals A over B, C. Just like that. So if you know the absorbance, the path length is just one, if you guys remember, and you know the concentration, then you also know the molar extinction coefficient. And once you have this, you can use it for anything else as long as you stay at that wavelength and as long as you're messing with the same chemical. So you can use this for different concentrations, for example. So which value or values in the equation would change if you used a larger cuvette? I want you to think about this and give me an idea. Well, the very first thing that would change if I used a larger cuvette would be the path length. 
A bigger cuvette would mean that white would have to travel through a greater distance. So if I used a larger cuvette, that would affect the path length, but it wouldn't affect the concentration. And if you remember, we said that molar absorptivity only depends on the substance and the wavelength. So this wouldn't change either. So if B changes, something else has to, the absorbance. So if you used a larger cuvette, B would increase, the path length would increase, and we'd expect the absorbance to increase with it. Essentially, it's the same with you think of glass. If I hand you a piece of cobalt glass, that bright blue glass that you guys may have used in the light lab, if you take one piece of blue glass, some light will get through it. The more layers of glass you add, the less light is going to make it through. So absorbance, the amount of light that's not making it through, will go up if the cuvette was larger. So take a guess on number four. How would a fingerprint mess with this? Very simple. Same way a fingerprint messes with light as it travels through a piece of glass. Because if I put a fingerprint on something, it's going to block some of the light. So the immediate effect of that is that absorbance would go up if there was a fingerprint on the cuvette. So it's important to always wipe them. So then the question would be, how would this influence your results? Well, if absorbance goes up, remember these two are constants, if absorbance goes up, I would have to assume that so did the concentration. So what would happen is if you had a fingerprint on your cuvette, you would falsely or incorrectly assume a higher concentration. You would assume that the concentration of whatever's in that cuvette is a little higher than it actually was because more light would be blocked by that fingerprint than should have been blocked by just the sample alone. So having a dirty cuvette usually produces results that are falsely high or overly high. Now, let's get into the mathematical side of this. There are three ways to use this equation. I'm going to show you the easiest and kind of work our way up to the most complex. And I'll also explain how these are used on the different tests and in lab settings. So the first is to use the proportional relationship between A and C. The assumption here is that we are essentially staying at the same wavelength, so E should stay the same. We're not changing out cuvettes, so B should stay the same. So this means that there is a proportional relationship between A and C, as long as nothing else is messed with. So here is a way of understanding this. You can set up a proportionality. So let's say that I give you a sample that has this molarity and this absorbance. This right here is just info. It's like saying a balloon is red. It doesn't really affect anything here. It's just important to know that we're staying at the same wavelength. So if I know that the absorbance is 0.328 when that same sample has a concentration of 0 0.500, I could assume that, let's say the absorbance is 0 0.980, I could solve for the unknown concentration right here. Because I know there is a proportional relationship going on here. So as the absorbance goes up, which it did, I expect the concentration to also go up. This only works if the relationship is directly proportional, which in this instance it is. Solve this by cross multiplication or whatever you prefer, and tell me what the absorbance or what the concentration is of this unknown sample. Okay, here's how I would have done it. I would have multiplied 0.5 by 0 0.980, and then I would have divided that by the 0 0.328. And what you should have gotten if you did that, rounding off to three sig figs, is that the concentration of the copper 2 sulfate here was 1.49 molarity. So if you notice, if the absorbance goes up by roughly a factor of 3, which it did, that we expect the concentration to also go up by roughly a factor of three, which it did. Now, another tactic is to solve for epsilon, or the E here. So, let's say I gave you the equation. A equals EBC right here. The problem here gives you the absorbance, it gives you the B, it gives you the C. Solve for E for me. 
Now, in case you're wondering, you should not have used the 90-30. It's wavelength, and wavelength does not feature in this equation at all. The only reason you need to know this is because at this wavelength, E will be good. So if you solve it at a new wavelength, E should change. So the absorbance here, if you guys had it, which you did, which was 0.225, we don't have the E, we do have the path length as 1, and then the concentration was 0 0.0. 0, 1, 0. Okay, if you solve this out, you should have gotten an E value of 22.5. Now, realistically, within sig figs, I should have only kept two of those sig figs, so I have to round it up to 23, which is a bit of a pain in the butt, but that's why we use better equipment for some of our labs. Now, so here's our first part of the problem we have the molar absorptivity. So now that I have the E, keep in mind I tested this second sample under the exact same conditions so I can use that same E a second time. Same conditions mean E and B both stayed the same. I have a new absorbance, so I'm going to solve for the C. Try it out. So absorbance in this case was 0 0.680. The E value was 23. The path length was 1 and C is what I was looking for. So the concentration of our unknown in this instance, I would type it in as 0 0.680 divided by 23. And I get a concentration rounded off to two sig figs of 0 0.030. Zero. Molarity. And there you go. And if you notice, the absorption went up from this to this, that's roughly a factor of three, and guess what? The molarity went up by about a factor of a three to match. Okay, here's another way of doing this. This is the one that you're most often going to use in lab. This is the one that the AP and the IB tests love using because it actually accounts for a great many sources of experimental error. This is the one I'd like you to learn how to use. So let's say that you test three solutions with a known, not known wavelength, sorry, my apologies, with a known molarity. Now they're all tested at the same wavelength. And notice that you got three different absorbance values. You can actually graph this. Now you'll notice that the graph is gonna be a little wonky because double the molarity did not necessarily produce double the absorbance. You have to remember that real world values are gonna follow the general pattern, but they're not gonna be exact especially not with the cheap spectrometers that we have. So, you would create a graph of this data. Now, if I were you, first thing I'd realize is that molarity determines the absorbance. So the molarity goes on the x-axis, the absorbance goes on the y-axis. Absorbance does not decide concentration. Concentration decides absorbance, which just so happens to be the answer to number nine. Now, if I were gonna graph this, let's see, my concentrations range up to 0.2. So I'm going to divide this out in groups of five. So there's one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, this is going to be 0 0.05. This is going to be 0 0.10. This is going to be 0.15. And then one, two, three, four, five. I'm going to make this one my 0 0.20. I'm trying to spread this graph out a little bit, make it easier to read. And then the absorbances go up to roughly 0.4, don't they? So to make life easier, because I'm going to run out of space otherwise, I'm going to do the absorbances in groups of four like this. Now I'm assuming that y'all learned how to size graphs correctly in math class. If not, I'm truly sorry. <laughs> but notice that I'm using as much real estate as possible on this graph so I can get a more clear graph out of this. And then when I graph this, okay, the absorbance or the concentration of 0.05 gave me an absorbance of 0.09. So 0 0.05, 0.09, first data points. 0.1 and 0.2 gives me my second data point. And my third data point at 0.2 and 0.37 would look something like this right here. And then I can sketch what's called a best fit line. Now here's the deal. Something to remember is that the if the concentration is zero, so should the absorbance. So you can kind of treat the origin 
as if it were a uh, point on your graph here. And I'm going to draw a best fit line in such a way that I'm encompassing as many of these points as possible. And my best fit line kind of went off track there a bit at the top. Now please keep in mind, if you do a sketch like this where you're just doing the graph on paper, this is great for making estimates, but what you should do is you should grab a TI Inspire, plot these points, and actually get a best fit line equation that relates concentration to absorbance. So I highly recommend that when you do this in lab, you use a calculator and actually get the proper equation for this and then solve the equation for whatever you're looking for. But be aware if you're just doing pen and paper and you're just trying to figure something out quickly, this is a good way to do it. So, we already kind of answered number nine, didn't we? So, number nine, what's the relationship between absorbance and concentration? Well, concentration decides absorbance. So concentration is independent and absorbance is dependent. Simple as that. The point of doing all this is so that anywhere on this line, you should be able to predict how absorbance and concentration are related to each other. So that brings me to question number 10. Let's say I gave you an unknown solution. You tested it under all the same conditions, same cuvette, same wavelength. You stuck it in there and you got this absorbance. Well, now that you have this nice, new, shiny, best fit line, you could go, okay, this is 0.4 right about here. And you should be able to draw a little, or 0.14, my apologies. So keep in mind, and I apologize, I'm doing this backwards. With the absorbance as 0.14, you would actually go sideways. So this would be 0.125. So 0.14 should be right about here. So right about here is our unknown. And I draw a dashed line down. And I should be able to estimate the concentration from the absorbance. So if I'm looking, the absorbance matches up with the concentration of, let's see, that's 0 0.06, that's 0 0.07, that'd be 0 0.08 right there. So the concentration of our unknown is approximately 0 0.08 molarity, according to our best fit line. Now the final question. Take a look at your graph and see what you think of this. If the absorbance is 0.89, I want you to see where that would put you. Our graph does not include any data that would include the 0.89. So this graph would be perfectly fine if you were trying to estimate the absorbance values between our standard solutions. But something you have to keep in mind is that predictions outside of the range of our data would not be very good. So even though you could theoretically draw this line so it went much, much further out, you could make a prediction of how the absorbance is related to the concentration much further out, but you wouldn't want to do that. The further out you get, the less likely your data is to be accurate or even precise at that point. So I would say no. And why or why not? Because you're doing something, you're projecting beyond the data. You're going so far past your own lab data that your projection or your prediction would probably not be very good. So if you wanted to figure out what the concentration is, you might mix another solution. Let's say a solution that had a molarity of one, get another data point way, way out here, and then extend your best fit line out to that point so that you could actually make a prediction at that point. So just a thought. All right, with that said, I hope this makes sense to you guys. I'll see you tomorrow.